Okay, I hit record, it should be recording. I see a Great. cloud with a red button flashing, so. Great, thanks. Hopefully, let me start by, with a couple of disclaimers. Um, I should say, uh, uh, as I often do, uh, I am a CUPE researcher, I'm on a leave of absence right now, but my comments today will not be uh, officially representing CUPE. I think it will actually represent a lot of CUPE perspectives, but uh, I'm not representing the organization. And I want to, another disclaimer, I just want to say very really quickly that uh, I'm going to talk about long-term care, for-profit long-term care issues and Rivera, uh, but I really am not a specialist in long-term care and there is some tremendous work being done uh, and, ha and has been for a number of years, both research and academic work and on the ground political work by people like the Pat Armstrong led York Carlton, other academics, uh, a Shirk project. They've done fantastic work far beyond, like I, I, I skim that work. I, it, it's tremendously impressive. And I can't claim to be, you know, at all as knowledgeable as those people, but I follow their logic and what they've been arguing for many years about the problems in this sector. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that along with people like Natalie Mara and all of the activists in the Ontario Health Coalition and, and people across the country who have been, you know, sounding the alarm about this serious problem uh, in long-term care for many years uh, to little avail. And here we wake up in the midst of a pandemic. And I think for a lot of people, and I include myself, uh, we've kind of discovered that there's this enormous, terrible problem of the for-profit, uh, uh, not control, but a, a very dominant and influential for-profit component in this uh, part of our healthcare system, uh, which we need to do something about. So I wanted to offer those disclaimers. I'm going to start with the first slide that covers, uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, my conclusions. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just to get it right off, right off the bat, put it, put it on the table. Uh, as Herman said in the out, at the outset, uh, Rivera is owned by a pension fund, uh, which is the pension fund manager that manages the funds of the federal government. And it's known as Public Sector Pension Investment Board, or PSP or PSPIB. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that entity, which is a federal crown corporation, was actually established just 20 years ago, 1999, 2000, alongside at the same time that they established this new private management company for the Canada Pension Plan, CPPIB. Uh, and the establishment of those two crown corporations, I'm, I just want to make the point that that signified, I would argue, a deepening of the financialization of pensions in general in Canada uh, and, 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 and was a bit of a turning point for crystallizing what a lot of people call the Canadian model of pension investment and, and pension plan management. Uh, now, second point, the Rivera situation specifically uh, in the context of this pandemic, as I said, I, I think has exposed for a lot of us that have been watching this terrible crisis, uh, just how far uh, this Canadian pension fund capitalism has actually gone. Uh, and I think it's appalling. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people that had no idea that Rivera was owned by this pension fund and uh, I think maybe open to considering this as a serious problem in a way that they might not have before the pandemic. The third point I want to make is that the existing labor movement in which I've been working for more than 25 years uh, and I've been working specifically on pension issues including but not exclusively pension investment issues. Uh, Argument I'm making is that the, the movement uh, and the unions that take up these issues um, has not come to terms with uh, this problem of pension fund investment. Uh, and in particular, the way that pension fund investment patterns and structures have changed, have been transformed in the neoliberal period in the last 20, 30 years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that has looked like beyond long-term care, and beyond Rivera. And then the last point, which I think is in some ways our political entry point and the reason that I'm uh, energized by this crisis and this particular uh, situation with Rivera is that something happened, this relates to my comments about the labor movement, 
something happened in May that you know didn't get a lot of headlines, but I think is politically very important, particularly for those of us that see these issues as a problem, and 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 see the broadly speaking passivity, inaction, silence sometimes uh, in the labor movement as a part of the problem. The Public Service Alliance uh, (PSAC) uh, has known about the PSP's ownership of Rivera for a number of years and have actually quietly tried to raise a concern, express concern about it in past years to no avail. And I know James is on the line. He, he has informed me uh, in more detail about what that has looked like, um, but to no avail. So in the, in the, in the midst of the depth of the, the, the death toll uh, uh, skyrocketing in April and May, in long-term care in general, and Rivera in particular, Rivera facilities in particular, I think it, the second most deaths in long-term care of, of any of the companies or operations uh, is marked by Rivera, and Rivera is the second largest uh, of the for-profit companies. So what PSAC did in response to that, like realizing just how grave this crisis is, is they actually came out with a, well, they wrote a letter to PSP and they came out with it and then they made it public, a call that the PSP and the federal government, because of this crisis is kind of a last straw issue. Uh, the government needs to uh, impose essentially a transfer of Rivera itself and its long-term care division in particular into public hands. And I just want to underline the point and, and the drama of this. This is not a call from PSAC that the PSB should sell Rivera, should divest from Rivera, or not have anything to do with long-term care. Well, I guess implicitly the last point is true, but they're actually saying it should be publicly owned and managed. And I have to tell you, if having followed this world of trade union engagement around pension investment issues. I don't think I've ever seen a trade union make a call like this. I, I, and I would be very interested if anybody uh, uh, at the, in the meeting knows of anything similar, even QP, and I feel pretty good about what, uh, you know, what QP has done and said and, 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 and some of the ways that we've engaged to try to uh, argue against uh, neoliberal pro-privatization investment of large pension funds that QP members participate in. Uh, for the most part, we're not very successful with that. We've had some very small successes, but there's never been a call like this. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate this opportunity to say in really more political terms, this is important, uh, what PSAC has done. Uh, now, it, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end, it may be notable that uh, no other union yet has joined or supported <laughs> PSAC's call. Uh, as far as I know, not a single union at any level, local, regional, provincial, national. And uh, James might chime in uh, later on if, if I'm wrong about that or if there's been any uh, recent changes. And I, and I would just encourage anybody that, you know, as a connection with a trade union, particularly one in the federal sector, but anywhere, uh, to maybe consider whether this is an important thing to the, for, for, for support for the PSAC call might be organized on. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, stepping above and, and, and away from Rivera for a moment, and, and I'll get back to it. I want to talk a little bit about the context of uh, uh, how that happened, how the Rivera picture uh, uh, emerged. And as I say, you know, I, I mentioned '99 as a turning as a turning point. What is now referred to as the Canadian model of pension fund management, and that term is used by people in in other countries. It's actually considered a a leading type and model. Uh, I just want to describe what that what that is, what that refers to. I, I actually just read a paper that described this, like a very fresh paper. So it's it's I think even more a recognized concept. What the Canadian model is, and it's really reflected by not just the PSP and the CPPIB, but also some names that people uh, in the meeting will be familiar with: the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, the OMERS Pension Plan, which is municipal school board, uh, and others in Ontario. 
uh, the uh, Opsu Pension Trust and uh, the Caisse de Depot in Quebec, the BC Investment Management Corporation that manages public sector uh, uh, funds in, in British Columbia, and, and a few others. There's basically eight or nine enormous public sector or public pension managers that follow and use this model. And the model is, I would say, this list of, of features. Uh, number one, uh, emphasis in their investment portfolio that is different from the old model, which was, we'll invest in some publicly listed stocks and some publicly listed bonds, and we'll make sure it's very conservative and low risk, and, and we'll do okay. That is the old model pre-1990. The last 30 years have seen a very significant move into what is called private markets, uh, which includes private equity, infrastructure, real estate, and what is now being referred to as the real assets uh, sector, which can include things like farmland, uh, think in the global south, timberlands, timber stands are, are bought and sold and financialized on both public and, and more likely private markets. Uh, and, you know, land, agricultural land that is that has uh, been subject to what people are probably familiar with the concept of land grabbing, where, where sometimes these things are acquired uh, illegally or in, in, uh, in ways that are inappropriate and, and robbing people. Second feature, in-house management. Again, the old model and a, kind of a traditional pension investment structure was you'd have a pension plan, uh, some kind of manage, managing entity, and they would hire, they would in Canada go to Bay Street or sometimes Wall Street, sometimes other, they would hire a money management specialist firm, uh, asset managers. And uh, in the last period, these big funds decided, let's cut out uh, the fees that we have to pay for that. And, and we will become an asset manager. We will build in-house capacity to do this investment. Uh, that is a, a, a significant structural change. Uh, and so in, in those big plans that I mentioned, 70, 80, 90% of the portfolio is managed internally. They are not giving the money to other people. They are, they are running it themselves. Third, I, I mentioned private equity, but I just want to underline the private market uh, 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 investment assets involve direct ownership structures. And I think this is a very big deal. And, and to my mind, this had me rethink my whole kind of view of what these pension fund entities are doing and how they, how they have to operate. Because what that means, when, when you're owning something in private equity terms, and particularly when you have full ownership of a company like Rivera, uh, which PSP has 100% of the private equity, you are the owner. You are not a shareholder. Uh, uh, like a minority shareholder owning some packet. You own the company entirely, and that means you actually have the authority to uh, uh, name people to the board of directors to basically control it outright. That, that is the relationship between PSP and Rivera and some other notable uh, cases like this new uh, for-profit transit system in Montreal uh, REM, which is owned and operated by the Caisse de Depot, the big province-wide pension fund in Quebec. Uh, now, it's not always 100%. Sometimes you might have a 15 or 20 or 30% stake in a company on a private equity basis. But what that means is you probably have a, a seat on the board and you co-manage the, the corporate entity with others. And that's also popular. Also a feature, most of the investment invested assets in these big funds are not in Canada. They, uh, the, the, this, the rules around foreign ownership were liberalized in the early 2000s. Uh, originally, it was only 10% and then 20 that you could push outside the country. By, I think, 2004, 2005, those restrictions were eliminated. And uh, pension, the, the big pension funds have taken full advantage of the deregulation of the home market uh, uh, restrictions. And so in fact, for these funds, most of them, 60, 70, in some cases, 80% of the portfolio is not even in Canada. And what they do, of course, is they search around the world for uh, jurisdictions to locate, especially for these private markets, where they will be welcomed and sometimes subsidized by uh, neoliberalized host country governments. And, and uh, for those reasons, 
as I've mentioned before in other talks, uh, Chile is in some ways the most popular destination for Canadian pension funds, the UK as well. So like the water system in Chile is owned, uh, uh, much of the system is, uh, is primarily or majority owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, for example. And, and water, I should have added water to the list of, uh, of private market uh, uh, interests. And then the last two points quickly, uh, I think it's also important to uh, mention that tax avoidance is a key integral part of this picture. Now, pension, these pension fund companies, including Rivera, by the way, uh, because they are an entity established by a pension plan and pension plans are tax exempt, the companies that they own are also tax exempt. So whatever the profits generated by Rivera, whatever they are, and we don't know what they are because there's no disclosure obligation because it's private equity, whatever those profits are, uh, the company does not have to pay any tax on it. Uh, that's important and it actually, weirdly, it gives them a competitive advantage when they're operating in industries uh, you know, in competition with uh, uh, companies that are not tax exempt. And I'm just gonna slip this in quickly, maybe we'll come back to it. Uh, I have recently learned, and this will come out, I think, in the next few weeks in some kind of formal way, that a, a, a friendly researcher uh, in another country has actually been looking at Rivera's uh, UK holdings and has found that uh, they are actively using uh, uh, corporate shell companies located in the tax haven islands, Guernsey, Jersey, the Caymans, to again cycle their revenues through these tax haven entities in order to avoid paying taxes even when they're operating in other countries where they are not tax exempt. So they're, they're full on tax avoidance like systematically. Uh, and then the last point on this list, uh, no surprise, uh, the, the entities have become organized, uh, I would say, especially in the last 10 years, to press governments to pursue further privatization of assets and categories that, that they have special interest in. And that is working. Uh, uh, for those of you that know about the Canada Infrastructure Bank that the Trudeau Liberals established in 2017, that was directly a product of pressure that was brought to bear by a combination of these big Canadian pension funds that want to own the airports and want to own uh, virtually everything that they don't yet own, uh, in combination with partners like BlackRock. And BlackRock was very involved in the construction of that in infrastructure bank as well. So just to illustrate, and I won't stay, stay on this slide for long, but I, I, I do like this slide. It just kind of illustrates my point that these Canadian funds are now in a club of international fi financial capital uh, that is organized and coordinated. So this is just a list of the logos of the main operations that coordinate in something called the Global Infrastructure Investors Association. This is an entity, interestingly enough, started in Toronto in 2014, 2015, and it's been growing, adding more names ever since. So if you look at these logos, you'll see, of course, PSP and CPPIB, Casta de Po, Ontario Teachers, OPSU, Pension Trust is on this list. And they're sitting there alongside, of course, uh, you know, some of the worst predators in the world. Uh, uh, um, Goldman Sachs is on this list, Morgan Stanley, all these investment banks that we know as, as notorious operators. Uh, and just recently, I, I, one of the reasons I like this slide is because you'll see on the left side, the name Blackstone, which is an enormous private equity specialist company. Blackstone recently decided that this was a club that they wanted to join. Their, their mandate and commitment is to coordinate effort to pursue and champion private investment in infrastructure. That is their agenda. And I, I interpret that to mean they are doing whatever they can to persuade governments and different kinds of governing entities to advance their agenda to, uh, to expand their opportunities. I'm gonna say a couple quick things. I'm, I'm gonna say less about this because I wrote this piece for the bullet 
uh, that I'm hoping uh, many of you have looked at, so I don't need to cover some of the content of that. But I still am going to just jump down and, and start say a couple things specific to Rivera, uh, just because it's a powerful illustration of this larger dynamic. So Rivera was established in 2006 uh, when the still building PSP entity decided to get into this business in the wake of, of these key changes that the Harris government had made, including financial commitments, helping fund construction, and, and they, they basically rigged a, a kind of a competitive bidding system uh, in order to, uh, uh, to bias things in favor of expanding for profit and, and reducing the share of public and not for profit in the sector in Ontario. And that was successful. Natalie Mara has clarified for me that uh, before Harris, it was, I think, 40% uh, private for profit. Uh, and now, uh, after 20 years, it's over 60% in Ontario. But it is still a mixed sector. But PSB buys uh, a, a, a real estate investment trust that had been actually pieces of the Reichman real estate empire and Central Park Lodges had been repackaged by Bill Davis, interestingly enough, into this new company. PSP buys it and launches Rivera 2006. They are the second largest long-term care operator on a for-profit basis in Canada. Uh, they also have a very large retirement home section. It's not just a long-term care company and they have significant holdings in the US and the UK. And I mentioned the tax avoidance. Rivera is a notoriously aggressive employer. Uh, uh, I know this even from QP contacts and other unions. Uh, they use all of their options for suppressing wages, fighting the establishment of decent minimum care standards and so forth, including through the for-profit corporate lobby group uh, that is notor notorious in Ontario for being so aggressive and so embedded with the uh, the PC party in particular, but also just very close to government. Uh, I already talked about the po Harris policy shifts and yes, yeah, centrally active with the, uh, with the lobby. Just mentioned the last point in the last, uh, last line there. I'm not sure if everybody followed this as uh, uh, closely and it kind of came and went very quickly, but just to give you an illustration of what I think is, is one of the more repulsive uh, policy changes that had been made recently that did not get enough attention uh, was in the midst of all of this crisis, all of these deaths, and we started to hear that there were uh, class action lawsuits being organized by family members of people who died or suffered negligence in Rivera homes and extend to care homes and Chartwell homes. Uh, what does the uh, Ford government do in early July after pressure from the Long-Term Care Association, including Rivera, the government passes Bill 161, which is described and characterized as essentially a kind of partial immunity legislation, which changes the, the, the terms of filing class action lawsuits against companies. And it is designed explicitly and clearly to protect the for-profit companies who are now subject to class action suits even in cases where they are guilty of criminal uh, behavior, criminal negligence. That's a, a, a bill that the Ford government passed in uh, early July. Uh, so to, to try to move to wrapping this up, what is happening uh, uh, as a result of all of that and what's happening in relation to the pension plan ownership, PSP ownership and, and what PSAC is doing very quickly. Uh, I already said PSAC issued that call to make Rivera public at the end of May of this year. Ottawa Health Coalition, which is a group that I'm a part of and a few others that have joined the, this meeting, organized a Zoom-based town hall meeting uh, on September 16th under the banner, Make Rivera Public. And it was actually, I should say, a remarkable turnout. We had almost 300 people uh, uh, join that town hall. And get this, over a thousand uh, registered for it. Uh, and that means we got their emails and contact and we're able to encourage them to, to start taking action around this. Uh, Ontario Health Coalition is mobilizing, as I'm sure you all know, uh, a major cross-Ontario cross day of action around long-term care, which includes three key demands, more recruitment and, and, and funding for uh, wages and compensation in long-term care, 
Number two, uh, uh, reestablishing the minimum standard of care that the Harris government had eliminated in the 90s, uh, which helped to create the profit basis for these companies. And number three, the other demand is uh, get rid of all of the for-profit operators in this sector, uh, starting with Rivera. So make the whole sector, including Rivera, publicly owned and managed. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I, so I encourage everybody, like we're doing stuff in Ottawa around this. Uh, and, and I guess the case I'm kind of wanting to make is that this is an opening. This is an opportunity where this pension fund ownership it's just appalling people. When people have been polled, there's been some polling on this uh, that says uh, in one poll, 86% of respondents, and this is a, a major polling company, 86% support the idea of moving this private uh, for-profit healthcare operations into public ownership. So this is something actually we don't need to build that much support from the broad public. We already have it. It's a matter of politicizing it. So uh, my concluding comments are political ones about the labor movement and pension plan management and, and what the, the task is uh, beyond the Make Rivera public specifically. I want to argue that, you know, the left and the labor movement, we need to reckon differently than we have been with all of the contradictions involved in the role that these pension funds have been playing in neoliberal capitalism. Uh, and I put in my slide here that trade unions, uh, uh, much as I'm very attached to them, uh, uh, they are understandably, but I would argue wrongly, very reluctant to criticize our pension funds. It's very uncomfortable to do that, and most unions just will not do it, especially publicly. I think this is a problem because this, this actually get, takes us out of the political game when we have an issue like this. And that's one of the reasons that most of the other federal public service unions don't have the courage that PSAC showed uh, in their call. Also, our existing retirement system, looking at it more broadly, the whole pension system has become increasingly dependent on financial profit making. And uh, I, I think this is not a new point for you all. Financial profit making has become increasingly dependent on very socially and ecologically destructive forms of capital accumulation, in, in particular going after what is left of the public sector and aiming to privatize and financialize it. This is a terrible development that we need to strategize to respond to. We need, I would argue, to press, uh, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> we need to get away from some of the illusions that have been spawned in, in the labor movement and in some parts of the, the social democratic left, uh, thinking that you know, all we need to do is persuade investors to become socially and environmentally responsible investors or to you know, fight harder to get more joint control over these pension funds. Uh, you know, my point is this was an illusion in the first place to think that we were going to structurally transform the operation of financial capital by having some workers or some trade union members on a board of directors somewhere alongside employers and, and the usual suspects. And, and I think we need to disabuse people of some of those illusions. Uh, and lastly, uh, of course, a point that I, uh, many of you involved in the Socialist Project, and I would say the the left uh, have been making uh, more and more sharply and, and clearly, which is that you know the political horizon that I think we need to fight for has to for the left and the labor movement has to involve uh, uh, beginning to include the socialization of the entire financial system. That means yes, banking. And we usually talk about banking, but I would argue it's banking, it's insurance, it's pension funds, it's the whole gamut. Uh, leaving this exploding powerful sector standing out there uh, 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 with its power is not working for us. And, and we need to disempower them. And the way to do that is to gain democratic control over them in some fashion. If fighting to make Rivera public could be a step in that direction, then I think we should actually uh, take that project seriously and use it as a lever to, to, to generate some debate about that broader project.
Uh, and I think that's uh, that's it. That was the main message I wanted to to bring. I I, I hope some of that's interesting. You're useful. I, I hope some of it's new to at least some. So of we're you. gonna we're gonna stop now, unless anyone else wants to make any points. Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming, and thanks everybody else for participating.